In this screencast, we will discuss the risks of radiation during pregnancy. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to describe the relative risks associated with ionizing radiation used for diagnostic imaging of pregnant women, and you should be able to differentiate between the two different categories of effects, deterministic effects and stochastic effects. When we're discussing radiation, we most commonly are talking about ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation is a high energy form of radiation that has sufficient energy to cause ejection from, of electrons from orbit of a particular molecule. In this case, we have a water molecule that's struck by radiation. The electron is ejected from the water molecule, and that results in the formation of a free radical, in this case, a hydroxyl radical. The hydroxyl radical or free radical can then go and cause DNA strand breaks and other damage. And in tissues with high rates of cellular division, this DNA damage can result in either cell death, if there is sufficient damage to the DNA, or it can result in mutations to the DNA that can lead to uncontrolled cellular division. Patients are most commonly exposed to ionizing radiation through four main imaging modalities. So radiographs like chest radiographs or uh, radiographs of the extremities, fluoroscopy, uh, computed tomography, most commonly thought about as CT, and nuclear medicine. When using radiation for diagnostic imaging, we try to abide by a principle called as low as reasonably achievable, or ALARA. And this principle is based on the idea that radiation is typically minimal or low risk, but there is a real risk to the use of radiation. And because of that, we should use it responsibly. To back up this principle or this concept of ALARA, there have been a few different campaigns, both in pediatric imaging and in adult imaging, to try to standardize the way imaging is used, to standardize the way we deliver or design the protocols to obtain the images, and hopefully minimize the dose that patients are exposed to while still getting good, high quality images. Let's start with a basic question. What is the risk of adverse effects from radiation exposure during routine diagnostic imaging exam. So I would argue that the risk is minimal for most of the routine diagnostic imaging that we perform. We can break the risks associated with ionizing radiation into two broad categories. The first category are deterministic effects. These are effects that typically occur when a certain threshold of very high radiation is reached. In these deterministic effects, the ionizing radiation has caused cellular death or cellular injury from extensive DNA damage. Most of the time, deterministic effects occur at radiation doses much higher than that seen in routine clinical imaging. So if the CT scanner malfunctions or an improper protocol is designed, you may see skin burns or hair loss. If a person is in a very long fluoroscopic study, like a TIPS procedure or a heart cath, you may get skin burns from that prolonged fluoroscopy. Or if there's a nuclear disaster, like fallout from a bomb or a meltdown at a nuclear facility, you could also get uh, effects. And then people who get treated for cancer with radiation therapy get very high doses of therapy, and that can cause radiation enteritis problems in their bowel. It can cause bone breakdown, and in some cases can cause anaplastic anemia where you've had sterilization of the bone marrow. Deterministic effects can impact the developing fetus, and the deterministic effect is often based on what stage of development the fetus is in. So prior to implantation, high doses of radiation can cause death of the embryo, but it can also not have an impact at all. So it's sort of a death or no major impact. During organogenesis, 
as there's rapid cellular division, a high doses of radiation can cause congenital anomalies and can also cause restriction of growth. After organogenesis has occurred, the deterministic effects that we see on the fetus with very high radiation exposure are predominantly causing intellectual disability and impacting brain development. Note that the effects that we're going to see are at very high doses, so 50 to 100 milligray or up to 2 or 300 milligray for the intellectual disability, and we'll see how that relates to routine diagnostic imaging on the next slide. On this slide, you can see representative examples of fetal dose from routine clinical imaging. The blue box shows you that routine diagnostic imaging in the chest, head, or neck does not cause a lot of fetal exposure. And so the fetal dose is very low, typically below one milligray. When you start to directly image the area where the fetus is, you are gonna have higher fetal dose and so abdominal x-rays, spine x-rays of the lumbar spine or abdomen CTs will have a much higher fetal dose, but still below the dose that you often see deterministic effects occurring. When you get into pelvic CT, PET CT, or fluoroscopy, you're getting into that range where deterministic effects can occur. And so these are the types of imaging we would prefer to avoid during fetal development. When we look back at the chart of deterministic effects that we can see in the fetus, the imaging that had been in the blue box of so chest x-rays, head and neck CTs, or PE protocols are well below the threshold dose required for any deterministic effects. Direct imaging of the pelvis, particularly with CT or fluoroscopy, is going to approach the threshold dose required for deterministic effects. And if you end up getting repeated studies, it, particularly repeated studies in a short period of time, you may get into the region where uh, a threshold dose will be met for a deterministic effect. So we want to be very careful in using any of these modalities in a pregnant woman. So what is the likely effect on the fetus of a CTPE protocol in a pregnant woman with estimated gestational age 20 weeks? There will likely be no effect on the fetus. B, C, and D are all deterministic effects, and a CTPE protocol, which would provide a dose less than one milligray to the fetus, is not going to meet the threshold for causing a deterministic effect in the developing fetus. The second category of risk associated with ionizing radiation are stochastic risks or stochastic effects. These are consequences of radiation exposure that are increasingly likely with increasing radiation exposure, but do not have a set threshold or a specific dose at which we know they will occur. Stochastic effects occur due to DNA mutations that result in increased risk of unrestricted cellular division and increased probability of developing cancer. Routine clinical imaging does have risk, and that risk is predominantly related to the stochastic effects, but it's a little unclear how great that risk is. And that's because a lot of our estimates for the stochastic risks come from looking at atomic bomb survivors. So in this chart, we see this solid line, and these are actual measurements of risk or cancer incidence and in people exposed to atomic bombs in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. This was a very high level of radiation exposure, okay? and the radiation exposure that you're going to see with diagnostic imaging is really more in this range. And so we've extrapolated the relative risk from radiation down into a diagnostic imaging range. When we think about what these effects are, these are predominantly cancers, leukemia and lymphoma being of particular interest in fetal exposure, and then in adults, radiation-induced sarcoma, thyroid cancer, breast and ovarian cancer can occur from radiation exposure, typically high doses of radiation uh, seen with radiation oncology. It's difficult to accurately estimate the stochastic risks associated with diagnostic imaging. 
based on atomic bomb survivors, we know that fetal exposure to radiation does increase the risk of developing cancers, particularly leukemia. So at low exposures, 10 to 20 milligray, atomic bomb survivors had children with leukemia at about twice the rate of background. So an additional one cancer in 3,000 babies. Patients with higher fetal exposure saw higher rates of cancer, up to a 2% incidence with 50 milligray exposure. Note that exposure to radiation doesn't just come from atomic bombs or from diagnostic imaging. So a woman living at higher elevation in Denver actually has a higher radiation exposure than someone living at sea level, and that translates into a fetal exposure of about 0.6 milligray. Extrapolating our experience with atomic bomb survivors, we estimate that that causes an additional one cancer in 5,000 persons. But realize the background risk of developing any cancer is very high. So everyone has about a one in three risk of getting cancer and a one in five risk of dying from cancer. So that one additional cancer in 5,000 persons is a very small effect and it's difficult to measure. The graph shown here has the background risk of cancer as the red line and then the blue dotted line as the estimated increased risk from exposure to diagnostic imaging. And you can see that relative change in cancer incidence is very small and therefore very difficult to measure. So how is the risk of cancer associated with ionizing radiation from routine clinical exams estimated? Again, we're estimating the incidence of cancer based on atomic bomb survivors, and it's unclear whether that is a good model, but it is the best model that we have. What is an example of an effect from radiation that has no threshold, that has increasing probability with increasing exposure? So leukemia is considered a stochastic effect from exposure to ionizing radiation, where A, B, and C are considered deterministic effects. In summary, we have two different categories of risks associated with radiation. Deterministic effects, which occur after a certain threshold of very high radiation and are not the consequence of routine diagnostic imaging. We then have stochastic effects, which have no specific threshold, but have an increased risk of occurring with increasing radiation exposure. Overall, stochastic effects are predominantly the development of cancer, but that increased risk is small relative to the baseline risk of developing cancer. Routine diagnostic imaging poses minimal risk to the mother or fetus but we shouldn't use it indiscriminately. We should be thoughtful about what we're ordering and thoughtful about the exposure of the mother and the fetus to radiation. Oftentimes, we can use ultrasound or MRI, which do not have ionizing radiation, instead of using an imaging modality that requires ionizing radiation. Thank you for your time.